This news is funded by viewers like you. Please support our work at democracynow.org slash give. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Nermeen Sheikh. We're broadcasting from COP28, the United Nations Climate Summit in Dubai, United Arab Emirates, where there is a day of rest today. So we're among the only ones, along with the workers in this vast facility in Dubai and the expo, uh, that are here. This week, protesters from Africa gathered at the entrance of COP28 with the call to make the polluters pay. This is Ina Maria, a frontline climate activist from Namibia. And, but first, Bekumi Dean Bebe with PowerShift South Africa. Which is why we see this. The injustices are undeniable. They are as undeniable as what has been said about the climate science. It's clear and we're witnessed here. We feel the impact more than anyone across the world. The droughts are clear. The famine is clear. The flooding is clear across Africa. The 600 million people without energy access is clear. The 900 million people in Africa without picking scooping uh, alternatives is clear. We want justice now, and we refuse energy colonialism. We want climate justice now. When you walk out of this area, just think, just think for yourself, is this just that your banks, your uh, 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 financial institutions continue to subsidize these climate criminals, because that is what they are. Tomorrow, when you find your house underwater, just think, who were the institutions supporting? Were the institutions, the people that are being criminalized, like our late cancer of Wewa? We are your ancestors. We are you. And we are telling you right now, make polluters pay. No. Make polluters pay. No. Make polluters pay. No. Climate activists from Namibia and South Africa, but now we head north. Um, that last reference to Ken Sarawiwa, a remarkable climate activist in Nigeria, leading writer who was killed by the state of Nigeria. Um, we're joined now by Nemo Bassi, a man who knew him well, a longtime Nigerian environmental activist and poet who is here in Dubai, director of the Health of Mother Earth Foundation. It's great to have you back, Nemo. In one of these climate uh, summits, you were arrested. I can't remember which one. Here, there is protest within the bounds of the U.N. Uh, summit. It's not allowed outside. We're in the United Arab Emirates. Um, if you can talk about what is happening here and what you think needs to happen. Well, it's interesting you mentioned about the arrest uh, that happened in Copenhagen at COP15. Uh, and that was when we were insisting that anything more than one degree Celsius temperature increase was setting Africa on fire. And now we're here celebrating 1.5, which is being missed already. Uh, so the, the COP, I, I, my thinking was that coming to this COP, uh, the negotiators would take note of the United Nations Environment Program's emissions gap report, which came out just a couple of days before the COP. That report showed that if countries do all they said they're going to do as nationally determined contributions, the world will be set for 2.9 degrees Celsius temperature increase above pre-industrial level. That would mean about four degrees for Africa and for some other regions. But here we've seen that right from day one, the agenda of the COP appears to be, the COP appears more like a carbon trade fair. Uh, it's like people are making deals rather than looking, talk about how to cut emissions at source. I, I'm, I'm not really very disappointed about this because I didn't expect it to be anything different. If you have, as we've heard, or as we know, an oil company executive leading the COP, the COP is already compromised. It's one of the largest oil corporations in the world, ADNUC, the Abu Dhabi National Oil Corporation, Sultan Al Jaber, Al -Jaber who is the uh, head of this COP. Yes, and uh, you know, we've, we've, we've heard so many things going on, and um, with, with the fossil fuel industry being so prominent here with bankers crawling the spaces of the COP, we're seeing a lot of trade discussions 
And, you know, this, this breaks my heart when I look at the way African negotiators or policymakers, the politicians, are bending back and accepting whatever has been thrown at them by the so those who are investing in carbon offsetting uh, or carbon trading mechanisms. Uh, we're seeing a, a sellout of African continents. Um, and, and we know the implications for this. For one, it means once you sit out a territory for a period of time, uh, you've lost sovereignty more, so to speak, over that place, over that forest, over that community, over that territory. And then you, it means negatively, negative impact on communities who live in the area that you are sitting on. We're talking about millions of hectares being mapped out to be sold for, for carbon, uh, carbon credits generating facilities. And, you know, some of this means reforestation or afforestation. It means clearing the land and planting new trees. Now, that itself emits, releases a lot of carbon from the soil. And then, of course, these new trees are, are monocultures, and they, don't, they are not as e efficient carbon sinks as natural forests. And so we're seeing losses on every, in every dimension. So if you could elaborate on that, Nima, what precisely is being discussed here with respect to carbon trading and the purchase of large tracts of land in many parts of Africa, in particular by this Emirati company, Blue Carbon, but it's by no means the only company uh, to be doing this? Right. Um, I, I think the, the COP has continuously been opening up the space for this kind of false climate solutions. And it's all embedded in Article 6 of the Paris Agreement. Uh, which allows for false solutions like carbon offsetting, like geoengineering, carbon capture and storage. They're all These are things that allow polluters to keep on polluting without cutting emissions at source. Uh, and, and so we're having corporations like the one you mentioned advancing to many African countries, to Liberia, into Kenya, into everywhere, Zimbabwe and the rest. And they're, they're investing, investing in quotes into large tracts of land. And it's really scary, some of the things we're hearing. We're hearing some countries may sit up to 20% of their land mass, many of them 10%. And of course, we heard about the Nigerian states that also are signed a memorandum of understanding uh, to sit out about close to 800,000 hectares of land. Uh, this is very disturbing. It's really disturbing. This, this is like green. Colonialism. We've heard that over and over. This is a clear example of, of, of selling of territories for a mess of porridge. And finally, uh, Nemo, if you could talk about, you're one of Nigeria's leading environmental activists. You have been for decades. What are the implications of the decisions taken here for Nigeria, the most populous country in, in Africa and also its biggest oil producer? <laughs> you threw in the oil aspect. <laughs> well, Ni Nigeria is a very important country on the African continent for size and population and for this kind of energy conversation. In fact, we always point people, those who want to open up new oil wells, to look at Nigeria to understand why they should not go that way. Uh, because the energy, there's a lot of energy expansion in Africa, uh, in Okavango, in Uganda, in the Solom Delta, in Senegal, everywhere you look, new oil or gas fields are being opened. And they're open for export, not for use of the resources on the continent. And so it's all about money and without any care about the people, about the environment. And so in the case of Nigeria, this particular way, the Nigerian government right now is very, very excited about carbon trading, about carbon market. They're following the examples of Kenyan government and others. Uh, and it's all about um, trying to attract resources, financial resources, without considering the impact on the communities, without the, considering the impact on the climate. And of course, we have a very peculiar system in uh, position in place in Nigeria with gas flaring continuing. And in fact, one particular oil well that blew up three and a half years ago is still burning as we speak. Democracy Now! is funded by viewers like you. Please give today at democracynow.org slash give.